Please be quiet. Thank you. Honorable Minister Councillor Tian Xiaogang, Honorable Minister Councillor Zhou Xiaoming, Honorable Mr. Stephen Perry, distinguished guests, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to PhD Finance and Economics Forum. Um, this forum is organized by Chinese Students and Scholars Association in UK and uh, Confucius Institute for Business London at LSE and supported by Education Section Chinese Embassy in UK. It is also part of the second CSSA UK PhD Forum. The other part was the Green Innovation Forum, which completed successfully in Edinburgh two months ago. Nowadays, China plays a significant role in the world economy. The, this PhD Finance Forum is the first attempt of CSSA UK to organize a conference focusing on China's financial reform and economic development, aiming to build a platform for dialogue and communication between academics, business leaders, politicians, and members of the public on the topic of China's economy. We gained strong support from various organizations represented by many of our distinguished guests. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our respect, respected guests. They are Mr. Tian Xiaogang, Minister Counselor for Education, Chinese Embassy. <laughs> Mr. Zhou Xiaoming, Minister Counselor for Economic and Commercial Affairs. Mr. Stephen Perry, Chairman of the 48 Group Club. <laughs> Mr. Zhang Xiaohua, the first Secretary for Education at Chinese Embassy. <laughs> Mr. He Yadong, the first Secretary for Commercial Affairs at Chinese Embassy. <laughs> Mr. Nick Byrne, the Head of Academic and Professional Development at LSE. <laughs> Professor Danny Kwa, Co-Director of LSE Global Governance. <laughs> Professor Shu Jie Yao, Head of School of Com Contemporary Chinese Studies, University of Nottingham. <laughs> Dr. Jing Hai Zhen, Vice President of the Chinese Economic Association in Europe. <laughs> and many more respected guests who I am you will sh meet uh, today later on. Now I would like to invite Mr. Nick Byrne head of academic and professional development at LSE to give his welcoming speech, please. Um, thank you very much for that warm introduction and indeed a very warm welcome to the London School of Economics. Warm being the operative word because I know it's the last day of summer because it's an Indian summer outside and it's going to be 23 degrees in London. But I think it's almost 30 degrees in here, so hopefully we can get that changed later on. But it certainly puts a warm into a warm welcome. Um, a few points I'd like to make about LSE. LSE is totally committed to China studies and to the study of the Chinese language of Mandarin. At the Language Center, we're going to be introducing next year the possibility for undergraduates to take up to 25% of their degree in Mandarin. It'll start small, probably about 50 to 60 students, but we hope it will actually spread to over 100. We'll be having ab initio intensive programs going right up to super advanced level 5, C2 on the common European frame of reference, if you're actually into that sort of Thing. But anyway, we are committed, we're looking forward to developing our relationship with the Chinese language, Chinese culture, in ways going beyond that we, that we do now. And certainly, on the LSE campus is the Confucius Institute for Business London, and I'd like to give actually a very, very warm thank you to Dr. Lu Hong and her colleagues who've really helped make this event possible and, I think, successful. However, the organizers of the event have really put together an amazing array of people. I'm actually stunned by the caliber and the quality of the people here, and also the fact that so many people have given up their time to make this Saturday be such a worthwhile event. 
I'm in many ways a consumer of the China economy. The nice thing about LSE is that it enables professors and lecturers to have a sort of benign schizophrenia. We are able to do our day job. My job is head of academic and professional development. Oh, there's a new word added into it, personal development now of students. And I'm also director of the Language Centre here, as well as being executive director of the Computer Institute for Business. But also in a parallel life, I am professeur associé de l'Institut Français de la Mode in Paris. That is the French Institute of Fashion, where I give two lectures a year. And many ways about global fashion culture. And what I'm really, really interested in is the way innovation is taking place in China in ways that are sometimes happening because of market forces coming in, but also things happening within it. I'm fascinated by the whole new wave of mastige, which is mass market and prestige products. Uh, there are also China products that are being developed from that, but the Japanese company Shiseido is really putting forward this idea of you have a mass market that does not want mass market identity goods. So what you're going to have is this incredible way of developing new products for a mastige market that's going to have an effect to the way products are marketed the rest of the world. Also, my business is languages and language teaching. And what China has developed in the Confucius network is something that the British Council, the French Institute, the Goethe Institute are probably gnashing their teeth in frustration. What China has done has been innovative, strong, global, forceful, collaborative in saying, OK, we're not going to buy buildings in major cities, have limited access to our resources. We're going to actually go to the people. We're going to go to universities, set up institutes at universities, and then go into the classrooms actually classrooms in school with Confucius corners, and really promote our language in a way that directly affects people, that directly works with teachers, and has a beneficial effect on school children, as well as students at universities. That is innovative, that is marketing, that is global, and that is something that we can learn from. So in many ways, what I'm saying is, you've got a very, very heavy title to work with. But what I'm actually saying, as a consumer and an observer of trends, whether it's in education or whether it's in design, I find it fascinating. So good luck, really enjoy today, and I look forward to taking at least part of it, if not all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Byrne. I'm honored to invite Mr. Tian Xiaogang, Minister Counselor for Education at Chinese Embassy UK, to deliver his opening speech. Mr. Tian, please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues. I know it is a very difficult job to speak after Mr. Nick Burns. He is uh, not only fluent in English, almost Chinese, and French, certainly, and so eloquent. And I don't know, uh, it is certainly very demanding and uh, challenging for me. But anyway, since it is such an important event, uh, I think it is important for me to say a few words. First of all, I think it is a very, very mm, a good sign to see the collaboration again between Confucius Institute and the Chinese Student Scholar Association. Uh, I know last time when the first session of uh, PhD forum was organized. It was uh, in Nottingham University, and I'm glad to see Professor Yao is here. He was uh, one of the sponsors, major sponsors, uh, for the last uh, session. And this time, I'm glad to see him again here. And uh, certainly, the support from LSE, especially the uh, Confucius Institute for Business in London, it is uh, uh, a great. Uh, sign for collaboration among different uh, Chinese associations and societies. Uh, that will provide a, a bigger forum or platform for the Chinese students to uh, demonstrate or to have a place uh, to show their potentials or their talent. First of all, uh, I would like to say LSE is a nice place. Actually, it is a lucky place 
for uh, those uh, who are learning Chinese and those Chinese students who are studying here. I remember in uh, March this year, we had a, a Chinese language contest here. It's called uh, a Chinese Bridge, Han Yu Qiao, UK competition. And we have nominated three of the Chinese speakers who are native British. And uh, they uh, participate the final session in Beijing uh, for the world contest. And uh, the result was uh, so inspiring and encouraging. We got uh, the uh, top prize, you know, the, the winner was uh, from Suez. And uh, we got uh, another two candidates got uh, the third, uh, third prize. So it is uh, a lucky place to organize something for those who speak Chinese and for the Chinese students. So thank you for picking up LSE as the venue for this uh, uh, forum. And I'm also confident that uh, we'll have a very fruitful uh, session. Also, I'm so glad to see uh, among the participants, not only the Chinese PhD students, but also students from other countries. So it is a, a good forum for us to discuss the uh, financial issues and also the economic issues in China as well as in the UK. So it is a place for us to share our views and to discuss the uh, issues of both uh, sides concerned and also the possibilities of collaboration. I, I'm not an expert in this field, but I do wish to see more collaboration projects, collaboration uh, activities taking place as a result of this uh, forum. Certainly the embassy, if especially in my office, that's the education office in the embassy, uh, would continue our support to the PhD forum. Uh, I do believe the forum will uh, give our students more opportunities uh, not only in their career development, but also even for their entrepreneurship, either in the UK or in China. So uh, I know that we got support from institutions or enterprises, not only in China, but as well as in the UK. That serves as a good bridge for the future development. So uh, once again, I think it is a very good sign for the future of our students here. I feel that we have about 100,000 Chinese students and scholars studying on the campuses in the UK. Actually, the number is still growing every year. Certainly, it is contributed to the devaluation of British pounds. And also, the <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that they are here not only just to pursue their academic studies. I think when the students here also having a good opportunity to expose themselves to appreciate the great culture of the UK, that's part of your life here. So we are expecting you not only to complete your studies successfully, but also to learn more about the culture and serving as uh, ambassadors or uh, as bridges between the two countries as well as the two peoples. So uh, I, I hope that uh, this uh, is a big uh, contingent and uh, the education office will continue to serve them as well as possible, but sometimes you understand that we are in shortage of uh, manpower and the way uh, sometimes uh, couldn't deliver the services as we expected or as you expected. Finally, let me say a few words about uh, China-UK relations. The two sides achieved a smooth transition of relations since the British government took place. The new British government, I'm sorry, to, I forgot the new. It is a coalition government. Uh, Senior figures from the British government, such as uh, Foreign Secretary William Hague and uh, Chancellor George Osborne, have visited China. 
the two sides are now working on senior visits, including Prime Minister Cameron's visit in China later this year. Uh, in the field of education, the uh, fourth China-UK ministerial summit will be held in Beijing, also prior the visit of the Prime Minister to China. So uh, the two sides are now working on very good uh, relations. We hope that these senior visits, including the Secretary of Education to visit to China, uh, will uh, open and constructive dialogues at all levels to bring about closer cooperation in areas such as trade and the investment, education, science and technology and culture, and uh, international affairs. Uh, certainly, I would like to uh, encourage the roles of Chinese students and scholars here uh, in the bilateral relations. It is so vital. I think it is uh, so important to have people-to-people -people relations. That's the most important thing. Finally, I would like to thank LSE for the support, and also I would like to give my contribution. Uh, contribution to the uh, organizers. That's China Student Scholarship Association in UK and uh, the Confucius Institute uh, for, La for Business uh, in London for your great contribution for having such a grand opening. Thank you very much on behalf of the Education Office. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Tian. Now I would like to invite Mr. Zhou Xiaoming, Minister Counselor for Economic and Commercial Affairs in Chinese Embassy to present the opening speech. Welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and joy for me to address this gathering of distinguished and bright scholars to see many friends, old and young. At the outset, please allow me to uh, congratulate you on this forum on behalf of the Economic and Commercial Office of the Chinese Embassy. Now let me share with you some information on current economic relations and trade between China and the UK, and my thoughts on the prospects of the bilateral commercial relationship. The economic relations and trade between China and the UK came out of the world economic crisis relatively well. The bilateral trade was forced better when the crisis hit, but then started to recover early this year. Actually, the trade is now back to pre-crisis level. In the first eight months of this year, it jumped to US dollars, 31 billion, more than three, more than 30% increase year on year. UK export to China grew even more stronger at 50% increase, making China among UK's top four export destinations outside the EU. Direct investment in China by UK companies began to pick up speed after a slowdown last year. On the other hand, companies from China have made a great strike in setting up shop in the UK with some 60 projects last year in the UK. The interest in growing their business in Great Britain has not been dampened by the world financial crisis. The increasingly 
see the UK as disabled to the continental Europe and the world beyond. Many of them set up their European headquarters in London. Over the years, China and the UK have developed substantial and expanding economic and commercial ties. All told, UK companies have invested something like $17 billion in China as of the end of last July, placing Britain the largest source of direct investment among UK nations for China. Major UK companies have all significant investment and have an appreciable presence in China. Many have major plans for expansion. They include companies such as HSBC, Standard Chartered, BP, Royal Tinto, JCB, British Sugar, Tesco, and GSK. On the other hand, the UK has become a darling for Chinese investors. The country has attracted over a billion US dollars investment from China, making itself China's number one investment destination in the EU. Sectors such as financial services, automobile, import and export, shipping, R&D are all represented in China's investment in Britain. On the trade front, apart from substantial and fast growing trade in service, the flow of goods is valued currently at about 40 billion US dollars a year. It is expected the two-way trade will be further expanded in the years to come. The momentum that has been built over the years will be likely to be maintained. The trade target, 60 billion US dollars by 2010, that's this year, set by Premier Wen Jiabao and former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown is on course to be met. Where, where are we heading? The economic and commercial relationship between China and the UK are now at a new starting point, a new historical starting point. China and the UK have much in common. The two countries believe in free trade, have a share of interest in making the multilateral trade system work. This commonality will continue to enable the two countries to work together on multilateral level, such as fighting against trade protectionism and bringing the Doha round negotiations to a successful conclusion at the earliest possible date. As the coalition government embarks on a ambitious, or you may say tough, austerity measure, it regards export and inward investment as crucial to its economic recovery. China actually is deemed as a critical piece in the UK's puzzle of economic recovery. Actually, when Mr. Cameron visits China later this year, trade will be very much on his agenda. With a huge foreign exchange reserve, China is capable of vastly expanding overseas investment. In addition, China is in the midst of a drive to boost its domestic consumption. It's also 
changing the way its economy, its gro e economy grows by adjusting economic structure. All this will provide enormous opportunities for exporters. China and the UK has a lot to offer to each other. The two countries are at different stages of economic development. Consequently, they enjoy different advantages. China's advantages lie in low cost of production, scale of economy, and rapidly expanding market. The UK strengths, however, on the other hand, are to be found in R&D, design, marketing, and branding, as well as education, of course. There are quite a number of sectors and areas where great potential for cooperation exists between China and the UK. These include, for example, green technology, creative industries, biotechnology, automobile, and high-end manufacturing. However, there are challenges in deepening economic relations between our two countries. And there are issues that both sides will let each other we let the other to address. Notably, on the UK side, the UK government seeks greater market access into sectors in China, such as financial and legal services. It also pushes for listing of UK companies at Shanghai Stock Exchange and calls for greater protection for intellectual property right. On the part of China, <coughs> the government of China will lack the UK government to play a greater role in UK's recognition, recognizing, actually, recognizing China as a market economy and lifting military embargo against China, which China believes are anarchism. China also wants to make sure that the operation of the Chinese companies here in the UK will not be threatened by the proposed immigration cap. Looking down the road, I'm pretty opt optimistic. I believe there are more opportunities than challenges for the two countries to work together and grow. And I believe there is a possibility for the two-way trade between the UK and China to reach 100 billion US dollars by 2015. That's four years down the road. Ambitions and challenge as it is, is achievable if our two countries work together. Finally, I wish good luck for the PhD forum on economics and financial and finance. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Zhou. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Stephen Perry, chairman of the 48 Group Club, to make his opening speech. Mr. Perry, please, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for asking me to say a few words. Just as I was coming up here, I was given some papers, and I wondered if it was my speech, so I'm just going to check. <laughs> uh, congratulations on the opening of this forum. 
Uh, the last time I was in this uh, theatre was 42 years ago. Gosh, that makes me feel old. Well. <laughs> and uh, I was probably uh, around the same age as some of you, and I was full of lots of ideas about the future. And it's very interesting to take a, a moment for me to reflect on what's happened in my life since then. So again, thank you for inviting me here. Um, to my two wonderful friends from the embassy who have spoken already, uh, the education department has done such a wonderful job in opening up the opportunity for British universities and colleges and schools to bring students from China, contribute to their revenue income, but also make a huge difference to Sino-British relations. It's wonderful to see our streets full of so many Chinese friends. It makes me feel almost a, as at home as I do when I visit Beijing. So <laughs> congratulations to the education department. And if I was going to make a speech on uh, UK-China commercial and business relations, I don't need to do it now because my friend just made a wonderful speech uh, giving a very good account of the situation of UK-China uh, business relations. And uh, on the issues of... Um, when uh, some uh, very enterprising and progressive uh, professors convinced my father to go into business with China. And when he started, he went to China and uh, some Chinese friends, amongst them Premier Zhou Enlai, encouraged him to open up uh, the trade with China again. And he said, but I don't know very much about trade, uh, international trade. And they said to him, but nor do we. But if you think that we have a vision which is realistic, then we can work together, hold hands, and build a future together. And it was on that that my father committed to opening London Export Corporation, and we've had a most enterprising and enjoyable 60 years of doing business with China. And my father was, I suppose, one of the main forces in founding the 48 Group and led the Icebreaker Mission in 1953, which was the first Western uh, business group to visit China. Anyway, that's a bit of history. Today, London Export Corporation is mainly involved in putting together sustainable business deals uh, that can last 20, 30, 40 years. And so we come to um, the issues raised on, uh, on the title of this conference. Can I congratulate the Students and Scholars Association on this forum and on the choice of title? As uh, someone said in the last few minutes, it's a very weighty subject. Uh, it's probably what uh, preoccupies the uh, standing committee of the Communist Party of China and the State Council every time they meet. How to achieve sustainable economic development and how within that to achieve financial reform. So today to be addressing that is to mirror those discussions because you are the future, you are the people who will carry China forward, and to be able to understand the current dilemmas will enable you in the future to be able to solve the future dilemmas. I want to mention just two in passing. Uh, one is um, the currency war that's being talked about now. I was on BBC television the other day, and uh, before me was a speaker from Brussels, from the European Chambers of Commerce, who called for a trade embargo. And I was asked what I thought. Well, I said, I thought we left that behind 60 years ago. You know, there are some uh, uh, different features of China's economic development and the economic development of other countries. And um, I first started work just after the British devalued their currency. And I can tell you, playing around with currencies is a very dangerous thing. It's very easy to make a fast move of a change of currency, particularly to please others. But you find the consequences internally can be very, very significant. And I thought what Wen Jiabao said uh, this week in Brussels about the issue was, uh, uh, was, was not for the cameras, it wasn't spin, it was just genuine, uh, um, uh, genuine speech talking about the problems for China of managing its currency. Uh, China can please uh, some other countries by changing its currency, but if it does, the internal consequences will be enormous. And it just cannot possibly make changes like that fast. And we've seen other countries get into lots of problems, particularly Japan after the Plaza Accord, by making fast changes to its currency. Very dangerous area for me to tread into, but that's what I'm known for, saying things about areas that uh, maybe some others won't do. But I think it's good to debate it, and I think it's good to recognize that the world will succeed in, in a peaceful uh, progression, providing prosperity and stability for all, if it's able to solve these sorts of dilemmas by conversation and communication and by taking the time to solve it in the interests of all parties, not just one or two. 
The other subject I just want to touch on, because I suppose for many of you, you will look at the issue of the role of business. And uh, we've seen in the West that the role of business can be uh, enormously um, propelling in developing uh, prosperity and stability for the populations. It can also be very destructive. It can be destructive to the environment, it can be destructive to the people. But without economic and business development, there will be no beneficial moving of uh, the society and the economy. So you have to find ways to develop it. I think we're probably beginning to find in the West that the preoccupation with shareholder value does not provide all the answers to sustainable development. In China, there's a much broader definition of the role of the company, and I think that's generally the case in Asia. Finding the answers to how to be very modern, very progressive, at the forefront of business, particularly businesses which are in competition with you, which are short term, is a challenge for China. So understanding how we work in the West and understanding some of the motivations for you will bring about corporate structures which provide the means by which China will progress and develop and find sustainable development. We in the UK have the longest history in Europe, probably the longest history in the West, in welcoming relations with China, in welcoming relations with um, the business and uh, commercial sectors of China, but also very much on the people-to-people -people side. I'm so delighted to look down here today and see so many faces of people that are here to learn and experience something of the Western way and uh, to develop some of the skills that are necessary for the future. We in the 48 group, of which I'm chairman, have a young icebreakers group, and I hope that uh, today we can build uh, even further on the relations between the young people in the United Kingdom, young people from China, and also the British Chinese community who are an important part of, of the formula for success between us all. So as I finish, I thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to be involved and wish you the greatest of, of success, and thank you for giving me the moment to go back in history 42 years. Thank you. <laughs>
Minister Council for Education, and uh, Mr. Zhou Xiaoming, Mr. Councillor for Economic and Commercial Affairs, who are both from the Chinese Embassy in the UK, for their indefatigable guidance, insightful, if not clairvoyant suggestions. Without the uh, assistance of the Chinese embassy, especially the uh, education and uh, commercial sections, none of this would be possible. So thank you so much indeed for your guidance, for your suggestions. As you all know, ladies and gentlemen, this world is now undergoing a serious financial crisis. One of the key issues that China is facing is to further implement financial reforms of the economic system by organizing the forum today, we are actually intend to create an effective platform for communication among business people, academics, and politicians. We aim to uh, stimulate in-depth discussions about financial issues, about cultural, the, I mean, the finance regulations, corporate governance, and other burning issues. And uh, from the discussions, we hope to find efficient and long-term solutions to the global financial crisis so that the Chinese economy can be driven forward in a consistently sustainable way. So we are actually here not to just talk about the theoretical stuff, not to just conceptualize, deconceptualize, and reconceptualize the theoretical things, not to just talk about the left wing, right wing, Maoism, Taoism, or New Marxism, or something like that. We are actually here to explore feasible solutions, feasible ways to, uh, to the problems. So uh, my thanks goes out to the scholars, the students, experts, and presenters who will address the above-mentioned problems today. And uh, I think this is a great opportunity to further discuss and explore all of the issues today. Finally, I think I would like to thank all, the, all my colleagues on the Forum Organizing Committee for your help, for your wisdom, and for your kindness. I would like to thank all the volunteers for your incredible job, for all you have done for this forum. And uh, well, as you can see, I can never possibly express my gratitude. So let me say simply, thank you so much indeed. And uh, I firmly believe that this event will be a great success. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Hoda. Now I would like to invite Dr. Hong Bo, senior lecturer in Chinese business and management at SOAS, to chair the next keynote speech session. Dr. Wall, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. The, this morning when I saw uh, Professor Kua, actually it reminded me of macroeconomics, to lectures and tutorials that he taught us when I was here at LSE. Of course, they were full of mathematics, I should say. So probably, 
Okay, let me, so we have two distinguished uh, scholars this morning. The first lecture uh, presentation that will be given by Professor Kwa. Professor Kwa is a professor of economics at LSE and co-director of LSE Global Governance. He obtained his PhD from Howard University and he is also a graduate of Princeton University. He joined LSE in 1991 after, taught, after having taught in MIT. Professor Kwa is a research fellow at the Centre for Economic Policy Research in London and a governor of the National Institution for Economics and Social Research. He is also a member of Malaysia's National Economic Adversary Council. Professor Kwa has been awarded many research grants by prestigious institutions such as British, the British Economy and ESRC. Professor Kwa has, Kwa has published widely in high quality economic journals, including American Economic Review, Econometrica, Economic Journal, Journal of European Economic Review, and Journal of Politi Political Economy, among many others. Professor Kwa is one is on the editorial board of the Journal of Economic Growth at the moment. He has previously served on the editorial boards of e European Economic Review, Journal of Applied Econometrics, and, and Review of Economic Studies, of course, among others. Um, Professor Kwa is not only a well-known economist worldwide, but his name has also been increasingly known in mainland China due to his active involvement in China. He has been writing extensively on China's economy and other Asian economies. Last summer, he was a visiting professor at Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management. His most recent speech was delivered on the 13th of September at the World Economic Forum 2010 annual meeting that took place in Tianjin, China. Today, Professor Kua will talk about balancing China's growth in the global economy. Let's welcome Professor Kua. Um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, Minister Councillors, Mr. Stephen Perry, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to get to speak to you on China's growth in the global economy. As you know, the, the topic that we're addressing today is on sustainable economic development and China's financial reform in the wake of the global financial crisis. Um, what I want to address today is uh, our aspects of this possibility for sustainable economic development. Now, there will be, you will see many speakers today on different aspects of this problem. I don't want to pretend that I'm in any way an expert on the Chinese economy. I observe China from the outside, from a global economy perspective. And so I feel safest speaking to you on that front. I want to talk to you this, after, uh, this morning about an external view on the balancing that needs to occur in China. I want to do that from the external perspective. I want to do that with a scorecard in hand. Mr. Stephen Perry has already remarked on how today probably the leading international global policy question has to do with the currency wars and the possibility of trade war between different parts of the world. That has come hand in hand with a discussion on global imbalance in the run-up to the global financial crisis and whether global imbalances that we see in the world today will continue to be a problem for the global economy. Now, given the short time that I have, I cannot afford to be too subtle about this. So I'm going to overstate some things and caricature them, probably to a degree that 
none of my economist colleagues will want to acknowledge. But today, there is an open question whether the United States will get away with labeling China a currency manipulator and therefore then obtain the approval of different international bodies in slapping trade tariffs, beginning a trade war on China. So the first thing I want to talk about is this problem of global imbalance. And I want to situate the position of China in this, in this context. Now, as many of you will know, that the discussions about global imbalance traditionally, conventionally, have taken, the pl have taken, have proceeded along the lines that there has been a global savings glut that produced a wave of cheap capital that then uh, flooded, we flooded Western capital markets that then allowed financial innovation to occur to such an extent where subprime mortgage loans proceeded in a way that pr more prudence would have dictated otherwise. Now, in that view, embedded in that view, embedded in that caricature of, the, of that view, is that China and the rest of East Asia, through their large trade surpluses, have been key in providing that wave of cheap capital onto Western deficit economy financial markets. Now, whether that reasoning occurs because initially there was a view that there was something known as Asian thrift that drove the global savings glut, or whether there is now this emerging view that China has been manipulating its currency, engineering these large trade surpluses, and that in turn is what is causing the global imbalances today. Whichever those view is, I want to put that as number one on the scorecard this morning. When we think about the place of the Chinese economy and the global economy, this is the 800 pound gorilla in the room that we need to address. That's what I will begin with. I'm going to flag that in red because that is the number one problem that we need to discuss. But then very quickly after that, I want to also take on and discuss the role of the Chinese economy in a shifting pattern of global polarity. Ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union, there has basically been one superpower in the world, the United States. And many people, many of my friends in international relations talk about how the international relations arena is now dominated by the United States so much that we can think about there being a unipolar world. I want to take a few minutes and reflect on how China's economic growth might shed light on shifting patterns of this unipolarity. But then I want to very quickly move into what I hope you will agree to be more positive territory. I want to quickly flag three things where unambiguously China has been beneficial to the global economy. And I will provide evidence on all of this, but first of all, it has supported the global economy at times of global economic distress. It has single-handedly redrawn the human map of global poverty on this planet. And third, perhaps not so well or not so easily recognized, I want to argue that the Chinese economy, Chinese economic performance has driven relevant technology, relevant frugal technology that could potentially benefit the world much more than the more obvious technological manifestations that we see. Most of us now carry around smartphones that we know have been manufactured by, or have been designed by Apple, they're manufactured in Shenzhen. We carry smartphones and we think that that is the forefront of modern technology. Actually, towards the end of my talk, I want to argue that much more important for technology and global economic performance need not be these obvious manifestations of high tech. What's going to save the world is not going to be an iPhone, but will be technology that advances the state of clean energy, renewable energy, and green technology. And I want to argue on towards the end of this talk, give describe to you empirical evidence that shows why China has actually taken the lead on this in a way that the United States has completely dropped the ball on. So towards the end of my talk, the three points I want to get through in my talk will try and be clear to you why when we reflect on China and the global economy, a huge part of it has been obviously positive. Before we get to that, we need to think about the first two items, global imbalances due to Asian thrift and shifting global polarity. Now, the view that the world economy has been characterized by global imbalance and that that has been an important part of what's led to the global financial crisis comes from a picture like this one, quickly followed by other observations. I have already announced at the beginning of this talk, I said that I don't want to claim any special expertise 
on the Chinese economy, and special understanding on the analytics of the Chinese economy. Most of what I'm going to speak about here, along the lines of these five different points on the role of China in the global economy, are fact-based, empirical evidence. And then, from this empirical evidence, I want to draw some conclusions, but I hope, and I hope that I will get you to come along with me on those conclusions. This picture shows how in the poster child of the deficit country side of the global economy, trade deficits have been high and rising dramatically in the run-up to the global financial crisis. So in the blue line here, we see the US trade deficit. For the beginning part of this sample, the 1980s through the early and mid-1990s, the US economy was roughly in trade balance. There's nothing endemic to or intrinsic to the US population that makes the United States economy run large trade balances. But something happened from the mid-1990s on so that the blue line that you will see starts to rise. And it starts to rise so dramatically that 10 years after the middle of the 1990s, on the eve of the global financial crisis, the United States was running a trade deficit on the order of 800 billion US dollars a year. 800 billion US dollars a year, how, how big or small is that? How do we contextualize that? 800 billion US dollars a year is 7% of US GDP. Now, typically, when countries run a trade deficit that's 7% of their GDP, financial markets look askance at that economy. 7% of GDP was what the Thai economy was running on the eve of the Asian financial crisis. Thai economy was running a trade deficit, 7% of GDP, and financial markets took fright at that, fled the Thai baht. The Thai baht went into free fall, all Asian currencies went into free fall, and that precipitated the Asian financial crisis of 10 years ago. The United States, on the eve of the global financial crisis, was running a trade deficit of exactly that amount. But then also, a different way to conceptualize how large this number is, I've also put in this chart, the red line, which is a GDP, a gross domestic product of a different country. And this country I've chosen to be India. India is the only other billion people economy in the world. And what we see is that in 2005, the US trade deficit had reached such heights that it exceeded the entire gross domestic product of a billion people economy that was India. So as I joke to some of my American friends who are economists who have a sense of humor, admittedly there's not very many of them, but as I joke to them, what I tell them is that, you know, in 2005, you guys were eating one India more than you were producing. That was how large your trade deficit was. Now, in the view, the conventional caricatured view of global imbalances, where I'm going to get to China in a second, what this, glo what this large trade deficit was driven by was cheap Chinese exports, whether they were cheap because Chinese wages were low, whether they were cheap because the RMB was undervalued, at this point in our presentation doesn't actually matter. The view was that this was driven by cheap Chinese exports. China accumulated, China kept its currency from appreciating by accumulating reserves, and these dollar-denominated U.S. reserves were then invested in U.S. financial markets, and that is what provided the jet fuel for the global financial crisis to then unwind. And when we look at the next picture, when we look at the US bilateral trade balance against China, it exactly parallels with a negative sign what was happening to the US overall trade deficit. So right here might be a smoking gun for why US lawmakers think that the global imbalance problem is due to China is due to the trade, bilateral trade relations with China. And right here might be a smoking gun for why US lawmakers feel justified in accusing China of current manipulating its currency so that it is undervalued, so that it can engineer large trade surpluses. This is the conventional view on global imbalances. This is why I flagged imbalances due to Asian thrift or the proclivity for China to export too much in red. And this is why the people who are now on the side of currency wars arguing that, you know, that China needs to appreciate its currency, revalue its currency in a way that both Stephen and Stephen Perry and I disagree with, this is the evidence for that view. What is the evidence against that view? Now this, from here on out, I'm going to take the opposite side and suggest that this smoke piece of smoking gun evidence has actually been potentially misinterpreted. Because one thing that we can present 
if we step outside of a G2 perspective on global imbalances, what did trade imbalances that the United States was running look like against the rest of the world? So here, I have put in this picture, in the green line, the trade imbalance that the United States was running against the European Union, mostly against just Germany, but bilateral trade figures against just Germany, just a part of the, Euro part of the European Union, are a bit difficult to just disentangle. So here I put all of the European Union, but basically you can think of that as Germany, another trade surplus country. Then I've also put in the red line, the bilateral trade deficit that the United States was running against, well, the oil exported countries. And we quickly realized that actually the United States was running trade deficits, not just against China, but against both the oil exporting countries and against the European Union as well, to an extent where actually if you add up the bilateral trade deficit that the US was running against the oil exporting countries and the European Union, actually, lo and behold, they exactly mimic dollar for dollar, fluctuation by fluctuation, slope for slope, exactly what the United States was running against China. Now, in this slightly more expanded view of the world, it is no longer so easy to blame an undervalued renminbi for the large trade deficits that the United States was running. It's no longer so easy to say Asian and European Union and oil exporter country thrift as the problem for global imbalances. Actually, when you pare down these data and you look at the trade statistics, the bilateral trade deficits that the US was running against other countries, not as absolute numbers themselves where they seem so large, but as fractions of what the US overall trade deficit is, you realize that throughout the entire period when the United States was starting to run large trade deficits, the trade deficit that it was running against any single part of the world remained roughly a constant fraction of its overall trade deficit. Yes, the United States has a large trade deficit problem, but don't get fooled by a partial look at the data and think that it is a bilateral trade problem with just China. Actually, the United States was running a bilateral trade deficit against most other parts of the world, it was against hundreds of other countries. Stephen Roach, who used to be Chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, and now professor at, uh, at Yale University, remarked on behalf of the United States that the United States doesn't have a bilateral trade problem with China. The global imbalance issue is not a problem with China. To attack China via a currency war or by specific directed tariffs is totally misdirected. Because the United States has a trade deficit problem not just with China, but with hundreds of other countries. And when you divert trade away from just China, you simply push trade in the direction of other less efficient producers, therefore actually penalizing US consumers and US industry. US industry, to the extent that these currency trade wars will emerge in a way that many US lawmakers would like, will actually penalize US productivity and penalize the US consumers as much as it penalizes the rest of the world. And so I would add to what Stephen Perry said this morning, we don't want to get into a, a sudden appreciation of any single country's currency, not least that of the renminbi, because the problems that it will produce are large, and they will be large not just for China, but they will be large for the United States. So my first conclusion from this, on the first point, are global imbalances the fault of China or the rest of East Asia generally? I would submit that the evidence is completely unclear on that. The evidence is inconclusive on that. And that, if anything, I, would, I might think that the problem of global imbalances in the world rests with the United States running large trade deficits against all of the rest of the world, rather than with China undervaluing its currency and forcing the United States to run a trade deficit against China. Now, the evidence on this is mixed. There's room for disagreement. But my con the conclusion of my first point is that it is inconclusive. We cannot blame China for the problem of global imbalances. What now about, very quickly, I know I'm out of time. I want very quickly that the, my point on global imbalances is the main point I wanted to emphasize to you. But in some ways, it's a negative point. It says that what many people, many policymakers out there think needs to be fixed in the global economy by getting China to adjust 
its policies, that seems misdirected. So on the question of the sustainability of Chinese economic development and the financial reforms that needs to be undertaken in, in light of the current global financial crisis, I say softly, softly. Let's not rush into anything and let's not be pressured by external circumstances where the underlying causes for the global imbalances at this point remain unclear. Let's not yet go along with the warriors in this currency trade wars that's likely emerging. Now, part of this discussion that I've just gone through, of course, reflects on what I said would be the second point in my presentation, which is the significance of the United States as the unipolar power in the current global stage, whether you're talking about the global economy or global international relations. And I want to suggest to you that China, growth of China and actually growth of a lot of the rest of the world outside the United States should be rapidly changing our views on this. That global polarity is changing, and it's changing in a way that as an economist, I'm going to present to you as a shifting center of economic gravity in the world. I don't have time here to talk about soft power, political power, military might, other cultural aspirations that different parts of the world exhibit. I want to show you a simple statistic. And that simple statistic comes from recognizing that when you look at the global economy, 30 years ago, most of the global economy was located in the continental United States, North America, and Western Europe. And so to the extent that there was a center of economic gravity in the world in 1980, it would have been located roughly at that point indicated by the black dot here, mid-Atlantic, about halfway between Western Europe and the United States, because that those two locations were where up to 70% of global economic activity occurred. Yes, there was a little bit of activity elsewhere in the world, but when you look at satellite photographs of the Earth taken where you use the nighttime sky being lit up as a proxy for economic activity, most of the world is actually dark. Most of the world was dark in 1980, and the center of economic gravity in 1980 was located at about that point mid-Atlantic, 24 degrees west of the Greenwich Meridian, west of London. What does the world look like now? Well, part of what this changing global economy that's been brought about by Chinese economic growth and growth elsewhere in the world is a picture like this. This is an animation that shows how the global economy's center of gravity has been shifting over the last 30 years, between 1980 and 2008, and then projecting forwards into 2050. So the black dots indicate historical observations on the global economic center of gravity that, that has been computed by averaging across locations on Earth. The red dots show an extrapolation going forwards. And what you will see is that with, by about 2049, global economy center of gravity is clustering. And it's clustering, coincidentally, on the India-China border. Now. About 10 years ago, Jim O'Neill, an economist at Goldman Sachs, wrote about the rise of the BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And what we see happening now, 10 years after they wrote, is exactly the emergence of what they had written. The global economy's center of gravity has been steadily shifting eastwards, and it's continued to do so. And it seems to me that this ought to be taken as a point of pride and achievement, rather than a point of criticism in possibly producing a pattern of global imbalances in the world, which you and I at this point aren't even convinced is the right way to think about global imbalances. Yes, the global economy center of gravity by 2049 will cluster right about there, just between India and China. So on this shifting polarity, I would argue that you know, what's happened in the world has actually been a very good thing. It's moved power away from the United States, away from traditional centers, and in the words of Tom Friedman, has brought about a flatter global economy, a global economy where more of the world, more of the world's population actually gets to participate in economic activity. So if I can just have five, can I have just have five minutes to finish? The, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, so now the three things that are unquestionably, indubitably positive about China. I've told you about one thing which was negative, potentially, and I've criticized that view. Then I've told you about shifting global polarity, which perhaps neutrally or otherwise you can view as simply a statement of fact about the world. And I want to tell you about three things where indubitably the Chinese economy has been positive for the global economy. So from the perspective, what I'm trying to build is the case for 
external pressures on the Chinese economy, potentially disrupting the sustainability of its economic development, we should feel free to push back on. There might well be internal problems that will be problematic for thinking about sustainability of economic development in China, but to the extent there are these external pressures, we should constantly be reminding ourselves of the positive things, or at least the controversial things that the rest of the global economy interprets on China. So the first of these three things, I want to argue that China has supported the global economy. What do I mean by that? I mean that, surprise, surprise, through the course of the global financial crisis, it has actually been East Asia that has supported the global economy. About a year ago, when observers were looking at the global economy and looking at the worst ravages of the global financial crisis, we were looking at estimates or projections that we would see declines of 15% in industrial production, declines of up to 50% in world stock markets, and most destructively, a 20% reduction in world trade. And the perception at that time was that this reduction in world trade would be most severely felt by the surplus countries in the world, the emerging countries in the world, China, and that China and East Asia would suffer the most from the global financial crisis. That if we were gonna, as a global economy, come out of the global financial crisis, it would take the United States to restore balance sheets, increase its domestic demand, become again the engine of growth for the, glo for the, for the global economy. And then, of course, within, against that conventional view, everyone turned out to have been surprised because when you looked at what world industrial output was doing in the red, in the current global financial crisis, compared to what it was doing 30 years ago in the Great Depression, world industrial output seemed to be roughly on track with what was happening in the Great Depression. So the pessimists took some comfort in this. World stock markets in red in the 2008 global financial crisis had fallen even more sharply than what they had done in the Great Depression. So again, the pessimists turned out to be right. And then, of course, world trade was destroyed much more sharply, much more severely than during the Great Depression. So right here is the case for the prosecution that said what we really need for the global economy to recover is for the US and other deficit countries to get back on its feet, restore consumption demand that would then restore world trade and bring along the emerging countries like Asia and China. But then of course, everyone was surprised because by March 2009, even as US industrial production in light green at the bottom of this picture continued to tank, Emerging Asia, whether or not you include China, had already started to recover. Yes, there was a sharp downturn, as happened everywhere else in the world after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, but then by March 2009, Emerging Asia had started to recover without the US economy recovering. China had started to recover, again, without the US economy recovering. And by late 2009, early 2010, Emerging Asia had recovered to a point where it was actually back on trend. Yes, there was a loss of economic value over the course of the 12 months of the global financial crisis, but unlike in the United States and in other deficit countries, emerging Asia and China was already back on trend. And if anything was driving the global economy at this point, it was China and Asia. It was China and Asia that was supporting the global economy. And as I know that some of my macroeconomic students are in this audience, you will already know that actually, this should not have been a surprise to those of us who had been reading our economic history because we realized that even earlier, even in 1991 and 2001, China and East Asia and the other BRIC economies had already supported the global economy at a time of US economic downturn. Now, I will not go through that. I now want to just go over the remaining two quick points in the next 30 seconds. First, that China has single-handedly reduced global poverty. And I think most of us have this sneaking suspicion, yes, I've heard this fact before. I've heard that the UN Millennium Development Goals are gonna be met, and the only reason they're gonna be met is because China has been so successful. And this simply reinforces for you, gives you an animation that I hope you can take away and remember how dramatic this is. This is the map of world growth and poverty in 1981. The vertical axis here describes millions of people living in extreme poverty, living in, in, at levels of income less than a dollar a day. The horizontal axis here is per capita income of different groupings of countries of single countries. And what you'll notice in 1981, the big blue bubble right up there is China, because China was to the left of, along the horizontal axis. It was on average very poor, and because it's very high up vertically, it was also had very many poor people. In 1981, China had 837 million people living in a dollar a day poverty, living in extreme poverty. 
over almost 90% of its population in 1981. The other, Greek, the, the size of the bubble here is the population, is indexed to the population of the entire country. So bigger bubbles here are bigger countries in terms of population. So your eyes drawn not just to China here, but also to India, which is, of course, we now know to be the other billion people economy. And in 1981, India was to the right of China. On average, it was a richer country. And it only had about half, vertically, it was about half the height of China, only about half as many extremely poor people living in India. And then there are other parts of the world which you know, don't really occupy our interest at this point. But this is the state of the world in 1981. This is the map of global poverty in 1981. In 2005, the blue bubble has gone below the green one. China now has half, again, the number of poor people that India has, and it has moved to the right of India. It has advanced in economic growth and has dramatically reduced poverty. Over this quarter of a century, China removed from extreme poverty 627 million people, more than the rest of the world combined. Okay. So when you look at an animation of what's happening here, this, keep your eye on the blue bubble, this is what China was doing. China was dramatically reducing global poverty, just as it was also growing. And Chinese economic growth, unlike that elsewhere, has actually been extremely successful at, re at reducing the number of people living in poverty. Some people might look at this picture, look at how India and China has evolved. India, remember, is the green bubble here. China is the big blue one. But of course, you know, some people look at what China has done in terms of poverty reduction and say, well, that's picking off the low-hanging fruit. Of course, it was easy for China to reduce poverty because there were so many poor people in poverty at the beginning of this sample. Well, actually, India also had very many poor people. And if you look at what India did, India did remarkably little in terms of poverty reduction. India, the world's largest democracy, actually ended up this quarter of a century with just a little bit of economic growth and actually more people living in extreme poverty than they had in 1981, and vastly more than China, ostensibly the world's largest communist country, had at the end of this period. And for those of you who are interested, the bubble that simply percolates upwards right there is Sub-Saharan Africa, which has shown zero growth and actually has seen an increase in the number of extremely poor. China has single-handedly redrawn the map of global poverty. Okay. Finally, I want, I'm finishing now, driving relevant frugal technology. What has China done in this instance? Well, what China has done is now pushed ahead on high-tech research. Applied Materials is a company that used to be based in California. It was, it was C, the CTO is Mark Pinto. And Applied Materials is the world's leader in providing high technology, engineering blueprints, and manu critical and manufacturing material for the world's flat panel displays, solar panels, and semiconductors. It is the cutting edge of what makes the modern global economy on the technology front. Applied Materials now has its largest manufacturing plant in Xi'an in China. It is the only place in the world now where that is large enough to build an entire solar panel assembly plant. It is where the world's re frontier research in solar panel assembly now occurs. Right next door to Applied Materials is Thermal Power Research Institute, which is a world leader, a Chinese company, world leader in, in gasifying coal, in clean coal technology, in transforming coals that you need to burn for energy from solid form to gaseous form, dramatically reducing its carbon footprint, reducing the toxic emissions that come from burning coal, and it's now a technology that American companies are licensing. In terms of China's, China and green technology, China now produces the world's great highest number of solar panels and produces the world's greatest number of wind turbines. Vestas is a Danish company that's the world leader in wind turbine technology, has just this last year built the largest assembly plant for wind turbines in China. And then finally, China's high-speed train, the high-speed train that China runs from Guangzhou to Wuhan, a distance of 664 miles, this high-speed train makes in under three hours, which is less time than what it would take Amtrak in the United States if Amtrak put its fastest train to run between Boston and New York, a distance of only 200 miles. China's high-speed trains 
makes a journey three times that in less time. And this is one of only 42 high-speed trains that China is building that will be in place by 2012. This is a clean energy, low-carbon footprint, efficient way to transport high-value goods and services and people across vast distances. The United States will, by 2014, maybe have one of these trains that will run between Tampa and Florida, a distance of 84 miles. So on this front, I think that we should actually put positive check marks against pretty much all of these indicators on China and the global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kwa. Uh Basically they, were, basically, they were talking about whether the uh, Chinese economy is sustainable or not. If you look at how China got itself out of the financial crisis, we can see clearly that China actually using government spending and export as a fuel for the, you know, for the, for the exit route. But we all know that the government spending probably can last for another few years, but it's not going to last forever. And the export is quite fragile considering about the currency war. So what's your opinion on this one? Okay, I can see. <coughs> I think on the, on the external front, but l let me just try to speak more loud. In the, on, on the external front, I think China is actually remarkably well placed. There is um, a growing, there, there is an emergence of um, high, tr uh, there's emergence of a high trade cluster throughout East Asia. So that what China needs to do in terms of its external demand, in addition to bringing along its domestic consumption demand, but what it needs to do in terms of its external demand is look perhaps more to its immediate neighbors in East Asia, all of whom are also rapidly fast growing, all of whom are also quite eager to engage in the kind of gains from trade that they might see happen with, with China. On, uh, on the fiscal spending, I think, yes, you know, there's no question that uh, a lot of the initial impetus to Chinese economic growth came from the four trillion RMB expansion that, uh, that you know, President Hu and others announced early in November in 2009. But the remarkable thing I take away from that experiment is how that was successful in China and East Asia, but not so successful everywhere else. Remember, the entire world was embarked on fiscal expansion. And it wasn't China alone that was pushing that. And what, what, what I read from that is that the economic strengths, the economic fundamentals are much stronger in the Chinese economy than they are elsewhere in the world. China has already, from what I've read, already started to drain some of this stimulus out of the system. And it's doing that in actually a gradual, very sensible way. Um, so I think on both of those macroeconomic fronts, China has actually has a lot of optimism on the road ahead. There are other issues. There are plenty of other issues that uh, all developing economies have to face. China you know, has them as much as anybody else, but they're not extreme to a point where you know, I think that Chinese economic growth will be, you know, will, will be hindered and we will, uh, where, we, where we will see that Chinese economic performance falter away from its uh, really quite spectacular success so far. So I'm very optimistic, generally. Thank you very much. Is any other questions that I can? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, what is the role of Europe uh, in this shift in polarity and what are the opportunities for Europe to broker, uh, uh, take advantage of this opportunity? Okay, I th um, my own perception is that the European strengths have to do with public infrastructure, ideas about public transportation, and ideas about appropriate governance that balances um, an overly lax approach to markets to, against an overly interventionist approach into every dimension of economic life. And what Europe needs to do is to figure out how its models of provision of public infrastructure and provision of modes of public transportation can be exported to the rest of the world. The United States has great lessons to learn from Europe in this regard. Asia, China have great lessons to learn from Europe in this regard. Okay, I said that I allow two questions from the audience because I have one question. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, um, Professor Kwa, you talked about the 
the outcome of you know economic transition of China and the shifting of the global power. Um, if we go back to something behind your fig, fig, fig pictures here, so the, um, the models, the, the models that uh, the economy, economies are performing are actually quite different. For example, the joint issue of the economies that actually discuss, discussed about the China model, uh, which is called the China model of uh, state capitalism. So which is quite different from, for example, other countries. So what are your opinion concerning the state and the economy? Okay, I, I think that the, there are multiple models that can work, that can generate successful, sustained economic growth. And what we've seen is that in, the, you know, in, in this decade, the Chinese model, or actually the Singapore model, has been a successful one. Yeah. But it is one among a range of competing models, and I don't, and I think that, uh, you know, there are many different models that will work. Robert Lucas, when he, you know, in an academic paper, reflected on how, when you look across the world, countries with such different structures nonetheless grow at roughly the same rates. I think the observation there applies here. Some of the fine structures, fine details matter. But in terms of the overall big picture on economic growth, many models will work, and the Chinese model is a successful one, one that I'm sure policymakers in China are already attempting to improve and refine, just as they had done in Singapore and other successful parts of the world. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again for the wonderful presentation by Professor Kua. So the second uh, keynote speaker for today is Professor Yao. Um, let me introduce you about Professor Yao. Professor Yao is a professor, of course, of economics <laughs> and uh, of economics and Chinese sustainable development. He is also the head of the, uh, the School of Contemporary Chinese Studies at Nottingham University. He obtained his PhD in economics from University of Manchester. Um, before joining Nottingham in 2006, Professor Yao worked at various universities, including Oxford University, po po sorry, Postmouse, yes, University and Middlesex. Professor Yao has published six research monographs and edited books. He has also produced more than 70 refereed journal articles, including Journal of Political Economy, Journal of Comparative Economics, and Journal of Development Studies, among others. I know Professor Yao is not old yet, but he is. He is indeed a member of the oldest generation of mainland Chinese scholars who have established themselves in the UK universities. He is the founding editor of the CA Journal, Journal of Chinese Economy and Business Studies. He is also the chief economic, economics editor of Xi'an Jiaotong University Journal. Um, yes. He actually he is he was run, ranked ace among the world's the world's Chinese scholars specializing in the study of Chinese economy in a recent journal published in the Journal of Asian Economic Literature. So the title of Professor Yao's talk today is Urban Urbanization and Housing Market Development in China, which is. Uh, of course, very hot topic. So the floor is yours, Professor Yao. Computer. 
Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the second PhD forum again. Uh, last year it was in Nottingham, and I think I see the forum is developing very fast. There's a lot of new faces in wonderful paper. Now, uh, you put me along with Danny Kwa. Actually, it is an honor, but also it's a pressure, uh, because you know what, what Danny Kwa means. Um, but I will try my best uh, to talk about the topic today about the housing market in China. This is a relatively small but very relevant topic, simply because of the Chinese housing market over the last two years has been growing very fast and the prices have been rocketing to the point that there's a lots of debate as to whether there is a bubble under development. And my assessment is that, yes, there is a bubble, but how we look at the bubble, how much is the bubble, and what the Chinese government can deal with this bubble about the social, economic, and political consequences. The paper is laid out as follows. I identify quickly that the key problem of the housing market boom, especially the house prices, are due to the rising income inequality. So before I conclude the paper, I already tell you the conclusion. But I will give you some uh, evaluation of the housing market situation in China and how it developed into the current situation. And then we talk about the housing price surge and what are the demand and supply drivers in the current uh, housing market. And we also talk about the beneficiary of the housing boom because you have developed a fairly vast interest group in China. And simply because of the vast interest group that actually uh, hold back the concept uh, rational and quick reform in the housing market. Then we also look at some indicator of whether there is a bubble under development. And if it is a bubble, what are the indications that you can present? Then I make some conclusion and also policy recommendation. Let's look at the income inequality in China because I think this is the, this is the key root of the current housing market divide. Um, Benny just mentioned that in 1980, actually I trade back to 1978 when China started the economy reform. China was extremely poor, over 800 million people living under poverty. But China was also an extremely eco society. The Gini so coefficient was only 0 0.16. I don't think you can find any other country which have the same e e equality. Maybe uh, North Korea today and Cuba uh, <laughs> yesterday. But the inequality rocketed over time as the Chinese economy booms. By now, the official statistics I say official, there may be some sort of larger messaging in the process as well. The Gini coefficient is 0 0.48, but there are some calculations, it can be actually over 0 0.5. And we look at the excess uh, distribution in China, the Gini coefficient could reach 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Excess distribution, no income distribution. Then I look at the concept situation because this is a byproduct of China's uh, fast economic growth. Everybody knows it is a social issue, but this social issue is going to become a structural problem. And once it becomes a structural problem, it actually affects the housing market issue. Let's briefly review the concept of housing policy and the market development in China in two different uh, periods. Uh, before 1978, housing was regarded as a welfare distribution, 
It is part of the part of the welfare system of the state economy. Basically, people living in the city are either working for the government agency or organization or state-owned enterprises. And there's no commercial housing, so those houses were actually constructed by the government agency or the state-owned enterprises or the so-called Dangwei. And this, uh, these houses are allocated according to the uh, services and seniority of the state employees. But this concept housing market has two problems. The first problem is because the price they charge for the uh, people who rent the houses was too low. They would not be able to allow new construction of houses. And secondly, the allocation of housing based on seniority is actually not in accordance with the economy reform, which Deng Xiaoping actually openly encouraged some people to get rich first and some reason to go faster than others first. So this had to come with the kinds of commercialization in the first decade of economic reform, roughly from 1978 to 1987, which is the so-called in-kind allocation. So instead of having free rent, almost free rent to the employees, the houses are actually physically allocated to the employee themselves. And in the meantime, the government actually charge or the working unit charge higher rent. And in parallel to that, then the, the, the wage system also reform. It was reformed so that income increased to reflect the, the rising rent, so that more resources could be poor to build more houses and reduce the house uh, bottleneck. Now, in 1988, uh, China also had the so-called land reform. The land reform, which actually monetized the housing distribution system, and land are uh, actually officially uh, confiscated to the government if they wish to uh, use the land for housing construction. There is a further deeper reform based on the uh, land reform. It actually, the government considered the housing market become a very profitable uh, industry. So the housing it become uh, the so-called piglet industry to propel fast GDP growth. But by 1998, there is a dilemma faced by the government for this kind of reform. Despite the fast growth and construction in the estate industries, we had problem. The problem is because the population are divided in terms of income level. Some people are at the higher income category, and some people are in the middle and low income category. So for the high income people, they find it readily affordable to buy commercial housing. But for the medium and low income people, they are struggle to buy commercial housing. So in order to, lease, uh, to reduce the, the housing pressure, the government have to decline a policy to build the so-called low cost housing or the low rent housing. But the problem, the problem comes. The government only have the, the policy, but it doesn't have a very effective mechanism to build the low-cost housing. And this created a, a deeper friction in the housing market. Um, let me just talk about the policy first. What they do, the initial intention is to divide the population into three groups and you also build three different kinds of houses. The first group is the so-called high-income group. In the high-income group, you use commercial housing to satisfy their demand. And then you the medium, the, the, the so-called middle-income group. You use the so-called economy housing or affordable housing or anji gongchen to satisfy their demand. And then you have the low-income people who simply cannot afford to buy any kinds of house. Even if it is affordable housing in bracket, they cannot afford to buy anything. So in those people, especially the, the, the so-called layoff SOE workers and the rural migrants to the cities, they have low income and they have no tradition of having any property in the cities. So those people are the, considered to be the low income and to satisfy their demand, you need the so-called cheap rent housing or the low rent housing. 
But the problem comes is because of the second category and the third category, it also depends on the commercial housing developers to build those houses. And the housing developers, they consider the affordable housing or the low rent housing are highly not so profitable. Actually, it's not unprofitable. It's still profitable, but it's not as highly profitable as the commercial housing. Because in commercial housing, you can charge fairly high price and you can manipulate the land cost in order to create a huge margin, something like 50% of the construction cost. So it's the profit-driven market developers who have no incentive to build the so-called affordable and low rent housing. That created the problem. But in the meantime, the investment in the housing market actually increased, but most of the increase actually went into the commercial high price housing. Over 20% of China's total investment went into housing. And the concept the council of residential fish investment just rocketed from 1995 to 2009. That's the latest figure. Yeah, it's faster than China's GDP by about uh, two times. You also the floor space increased enormously. The uh, the dark blue, the dark one is the urban per capita floor space, and the other the other part is the rural. So both rural and urban floor space increase quite dramatically. Actually, by um, 2008, the average housing floor space for urban is over 28 square meters. That compared to 6.7 is an extraordinary increase. And for the rural, it's 32 square, kilo, uh, meet, square meters, which is also a significant improvement. But for God's sake, if you look at the average, it means that the Chinese housing condition is fairly good already. But why people are crying? <laughs> why people are shouting? Why people's uh, happy, the so-called happiness index is declining? <laughs> right. I give you some explanation. But before the, I present a, 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 a theoretical framework, let me give you some sort of uh, demand pool and supply push factors. Demand. Market demand certainly increased enormously by the following factors. First of all is the acceleration of urbanization. In 1978, the urban population accounted only 13%. And today, it's almost half of the population. The latest statistics is almost half. So the rural population in absolute sense actually have been declining. The growth rate is negative. But in the urban, the, the growth rate is something like 3.5%. This increased a lot of pressure on housing demand. In the meantime, rising income, the Chinese per capita GDP over the last 30 years increased something like 16 times per capita GDP. In personal disposable income, it increased like just roughly 10 times. So a 10 times increase in disposable income must be spent on something, right? And housing is one of the biggest consumers' items. Also, China's consumption habit. Chinese people always try to say all something, including uh, you know, a poet in the, in the Tang Dynasty, Du Pu. Yeah, he tried to dream that all the people would have a house to live. And Chinese try to dream to have a house to warm, not just live, okay? This is kind of thing, so the housing ownership in China is actually among the highest in the world, higher than the United Kingdom, higher than the US, higher than, much higher than Germany. The Chinese habit is I must own the house rather than rent the house. 80% of housing ownership of the population. Then we, you got the demographic change. The average household size have declined rapidly due to the one-child policy, due to the migration into the city. And um, the average household size declined something like from 3.7 to 3.1. This means that 
this, uh, if you hold the total population unchanged, the number of households increase. And if the number of households increases, uh, satellite parallels, then you need more houses. Then you look up, you have the lack of investment channel. People invested heavily in 2003 and 2006 and 2007 in the stock market, yeah? People try to pump money into the stock market, into getting cleaner and taxi drivers, and some people uh, lose their money immediately at the end of 2007. Now, the stock market, the stock, stock price is something like 2,600, and people are reluctant to invest. Despite I encourage them to do it all the time, <laughs> but they don't listen to me. They just invest in housing market. I think people are going to make a huge mistake. <laughs> Supply push. Locally, the local government actually have a habit of selling land to get uh, uh, revenues. And actually, land are not sold. Be careful. They just actually transfer the so-called use right, not the ownership right, unlike we bought the house in the UK. 60 years of, of lease right. So they call transfer rather than sold. Developers, they actually uh, develop the so-called unbalanced supplies and holding habit. So the developers, they build the house, and they don't sell it. I have a telephone uh, a few days ago into Shanto, where my uh, cousin is uh, working in Shanto University. He said, brother, you know how crazy the Shanto people now in buying houses? You have to join the VIP club. <laughs> and the entry price of the VIP is something like 200,000 renminbi. Unrefundable, unrefundable, yeah? Uh, just to look at the picture of the house. <laughs> and it's just like a natural lot lottery. Like, yeah, I give you a ticket, you give me 200,000 renminbi, and the house will be built next year. And then you come, pay the 50% pay the deposit. That's it. Now look, if I were working in Shanto, I won't be able to buy the VIP because I don't earn 200,000. You don't believe me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I said 200,000 pounds, of course. <laughs> um, the developer have imbalanced supply. Uh, this is the problem. And, and there's no government who can do anything about it. They call this market economy, for God's sake. There's a lack of investment in economy housing. So economy in Economy housing investment in 1998 when the government issued a new policy, 13% of investment, which is already ridiculous little. Yeah? But by 2008, there's only 4.3% of investment in the affordable housing. 95.67% are invested in the speculative, high profitable margin commercial housing. There's no wonder. There's a shortage of house. Here you come, I give you some market analysis. For those people who study micro, actually, Danny Kwa tell you macro, I tell you some little bit micro. If you, if you recognize this, uh, this D and S, the supply and demand curve, and we assume that the Chinese market is homogeneous, the population are homogeneous. Homogeneous in the sense that the income are continuous, the demand are also continuous. The cost of construction are also continuous. So this is called homogeneous. The supply curve is like this. If the price go up, you, you supply more houses. And for demand, if the price go down, you, you, you demand more. But there is a market equilibrium here at A. Yeah? And the, the market traded amount is Q1. The price is P1. OK, everybody is happy. The market is clear. But if you want to reduce the demand pressure, what do you do? You just build more houses by reducing the cost, by making the production more efficient, so you shift the supply curve to the right. And at that time, you have more production, the price is low, like the auto industry in China, right? This is an ideal situation. It's a free competitive market. Unfortunately, China 
Chinese market is not homogeneous. It's totally heterogeneous, like what these pictures show. Now, in a heterogeneous market, I simplify. There are only two equilibrium points. The first equilibrium point is similar to the one I just tell you, the commercial housing. Now, the new equilibrium is A1. The quantity is QA. The, the price is PA, OK? This is for the commercial housing for the high income people. And the high income people are happy because they are uh, relatively uh, more supply in the commercial housing sector. But how about the low income and middle income people? This, they created another market. And there must be another market equilibrium. This new market equilibrium is here at the lower end. Because the costs are low, the supply curve are much flatter. And because people's income are much lower, the demand curve are also lower. But let's simplify. The new, the new equilibrium point is A2. The price is PB. The quantity is QB. This means that there's an equilibrium for the middle and low income people. Now, if China is able to build up these two equilibrium, then there's no problem. People will not be shouting. People won't be unhappy, actually, even they are poor. The problem come just the following. The developers, they don't build QB. The developers, they don't build QB. They build for the affordable housing a QB prime. A QB prime, there are a number of consequences. One obvious consequence is, you can see, the quantity of supply is substantially reduced artificially. But the market price is higher, artificially higher, much higher than PB, so it would be PB prime. And there's an abnormal profit. This, the so-called monopoly profit, go to the housing developers and the local governments. Yeah. If you understand this picture, you understand the Chinese market. If you don't understand, sorry. <laughs> but there's another consequence. Look, because the artificially high affordable housing house price is P, PB prime, it's fairly, actually fairly close to PA compared to PB to PA. Because they are closer, what does it mean? Because the so-called affordable housing is small and low quality, so if you sell a low price, people will be happy. If you sell a high price, they will be compelling the high quality commercial housing. So the difference between PB prime and PA does not give enough incentive for people to go to the lower quality housing. So some people at the middle income brackets, as long as they can eat their parents and their grandparents. <laughs> In Chinese, it's called Ken Lao. You understand my meaning? Yes. Your father is Lao like me. <laughs> your, your, your grandfather is even older than me. Yeah? And they, they have their lifetime saving. You eat them. <laughs> so once they eat them, then they will try to buy a commercial housing here. And they give more pressure to the commercial housing. And they artificially creating more demand for the commercial housing, artificially creating the VIP club in Santo City I just mentioned. <laughs> OK. Anyway. Who are the winners of these games? The SOE workers who have privilege, especially the large SOE under the State Access Management Corporation or Commission. And the local developers who abuse land and use bribery for the local government officials. And then the local government who have incentive to transfer their income as fees, tax, and also the transfer fee. And some of these people have corruption. In Zhejiang province last year, 63 land bureau chief at the county level was Suan Gui. <laughs> uh, sorry, for the English speaking people, you have to learn some Chinese. 
Um, but let's look at the housing bubble. Why it is a bubble? Um, there are a number of indicators that may uh, suggest it is a bubble in development. Let's look at the first tables here. The first bubble indication is the so-called um, house, pri house price and the annual income ratio. In 2009, the Chinese average is 9.1. In Beijing, it's 21. Shanghai, is 22. Hainan, a poor, a poor Hainan island, is 11. <laughs> I came from Hainan Island. I know how poor it is. <laughs> it's not insulting the place I study. I'm insulting the behavior. In 2010, this increase to almost 10. In Beijing is 30, in Shanghai is 23, in Hainan is 16. It's even more crazy in Hainan. The price increased just by 100% in three weeks. But in the UK is 5.1, US is about, about less than three. And if you look at um, London, it's 6.1. In New York, it's 4.45. So there's no justification. Yeah, Chinese can sustain the kinds of level of price. The other thing is that the urban expenditure on housing is the total income of urban households. This ratio increased from 10% to 40%. So people are pumping more and more money into the housing. So they do nothing now. They only just save money and put into the housing market. Yesterday I was having dinner with the uh, minister councillor who just made the keynote speech this morning. I was saying that why you buy those stupid houses because uh, in 20 years time those houses will be destroyed because their lifetime, their average life of Chinese house is 25, 30, 30 years. You bought the house, you spend about uh, uh, 6 million, right? And you put there, you don't rent it out. 20 years later, you come back, this becomes rubbish. <laughs> so why you buy those houses? Um, other indicators is the investment I just mentioned is much bigger than uh, the GDP uh, contribution to GDP, twice as much as the contribution to GDP. So the invest, there's an investment bubble. Also, the so-called price rent ratio in uh, international norm, it's about 150 to 250 uh, of, of, of uh, you know, you would, basically you take 150 months or 250 months to repay the whole house. But in China, the national, it takes about 383 months. In Beijing, it takes 456 months. So in terms of investment, just to get the rent, it's also uh, irrational. Another indicator, because people say because the construction cost has increased, this is why the price has to increase. This is not a good excuse because the construction cost is just like this. Yeah. And the, the commercial housing uh, price is just like this. So the scissors difference, yeah, the scissors difference, I means the profit margin actually increase all the time. So why? Um, Finally, I actually tried to demonstrate it. I know a little bit mathematics, but, um, <laughs> but I think it could be very boring in this kind of audience. So I skip, but I'll tell you uh, just why I intend to do what I intend to do. I say China actually has a national development target of something like 35 square uh, meters per capita. And this target, based on the dynamic urban populations, something like 3% annual growth, and also the house destruction rate is 3% or so. It would take about 30 to 20 years, 20 to 30 years. It depends on how much investment into the housing. If we assume 10% annual growth, it takes 20 years. If we assume 6.7%, it takes 30 years. What does it mean? 
It means that to reach these kinds of uh, comfortable living standards, it would take about 30, 20 to 30 years. So the housing market issue is going to be a long and painful issue. But more painful than this is that the, distrib the distribution is so unequal that some people are actually occupy over 1,000 square meters, like Chen Daoming <laughs> and, and Zhao Bensan. But some people like me have no square meters at all. <laughs> when I'm a professor in Xi'an, I always say, you must give me some house. And say, OK, we have a hotel room there. <laughs> and seven years ago, the price is 2,500 per square meters. Today, it's about in the a good location, is 10,000. So I found it unaffordable because they pay me too little. Um, well, I shouldn't complain, actually. Compared to the local professor, I did actually get more pay and work less time. Conclusion. Um, I, despite all this criticism, I have to say uh, some positive remark. Over the last 15 years in particular, not 30, 15 years, house construction in China actually increased enormously. Otherwise, the living condition of the city won't be as good as today. Yesterday, there's um, a student uh, telling me that he interviewed some people from India and interviewed some people from China, and that the Indian students are more happy uh, than the Chinese students. And I say, maybe your sample is pretty biased. Because if I were Indian, I would say India is not a very good place to live. India had much more time to catch up with China because I actually visited India some time ago. So in a sense, China had been doing very well compared to similar countries like India, and certainly much better than Africa, no doubt. <laughs> but, but China's ambition is not to be less than India. China's ambition is not to be sub-Saharan Africa, right? China's ambition is not going to be just a lot, a slightly better than Sudan. <laughs> it, do you know what China's ambition? China's ambition is going to be a superpower, going to catch up not only in absolute sense, but also in relative sense with Western Europe, with Japan, with the United States. And why people are not happy, why people are so impatient to be happy, is because we have a long way to go to fulfill our ambitions. And I hope this lecture, sorry, this talk, not a lecture, <laughs> um, is going to contribute to the process of the housing market, and without dissolving the housing market, the Chinese economy is going to be jeopardized. It's very serious, and the government have to take a very careful measures by treating housing not as a commodity, but as something that the government can play a great role in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yeo. I'm sure there will be a lot, lot of questions given the topic, and everybody is very interested in the housing things. Uh, where is the Professor? Yes. <laughs> Are you going to stand here? So um, let's let's see how many questions are there in the audience. Yes, Professor Kwa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yao, for, for that speech. Can, I have uh, some questions about the, some of the evidence that you presented. The, in particular, the, the statistics that you gave us on the ratio of house price to incomes makes it seem like, ma makes it, of course, plain 
that the Chinese house prices are so much higher relative to income than anywhere else in the world. I suppose I have two questions. First is that uh, the Chinese economy is also growing a lot faster than the economies in either London or New York. And since houses are a durable asset, what matters is not the ratio of house prices to income today, but the ratio of house prices to my average of incomes over now and the immediate future. So given how fast growth is in China, those numbers will seem less less stark, less, less controversial. So I wonder if you have a reaction to that. And second quick comment is, uh, many houses as we know in the United States and the United Kingdom are bought through loans, through, making, through raising mortgage loans, through credit. And I, would, I don't know if there are figures for what fraction of the houses in China, in Beijing, and Shanghai are actually bought with cash, with people actually giving the money right up front. Yeah. Thanks. The, Thank you. The first question is very easy to answer because you are talking about China's fast growth. And given the concept of uh, house price and income ratio, it looks high at the moment. But when China grow uh, rapidly, this uh, ratio will be going down. But then it's unfortunately, the house price is going faster than the income. So this high ratio is going to continue. And if this high ratio is going to continue, that means the house price is going to be overvalued, even when you, you take, let's say, five or 10 years' time. It is true that people in Beijing and Shanghai are cost buyer. I remember when I had a conference uh, in Shanghai, and I actually spent the whole day just walking, wandering along, along the Shanghai street. And I, I went to a shop. I was shocked almost, you know, uh, without saying anything. The, the house price there, he said, is the Xin Tian Di in Shanghai. One square meters, ranging from 100,000 to 150,000 per square meters. And I was so curious because Tan Teng Yi Hao means that the, one of the most uh, famous and expensive that's always reported in the newspaper. That was mm -hmm. the most expensive one. They say it's only 80,000. So they, something got to be better than Tan Teng Yi Hao. So I actually asked the ex-state agent, say, can I see out one of the house? And they say, OK. So they took me there on the 20, 23rd floor. It said 170 square meters. But the actual use of the area I measure in my eye, or of course I have some error, is something like 100 to 110 square meters. You know how much it costs? 15 million. And you know, the, the location I don't think is very good. Because, um, <laughs> be because the window is so slim, and the, the kitchen is so dirty. <laughs> And the air conditioning was almost broken. <laughs> and the shower is rusted, right? And when I look at the window, I said, my God, I almost tried to, because I have afraid of height. <laughs> I said, of oh course, this, if this house just give me free, I can't stay here. Oh, really? <laughs> and the agent just called me last week. They said, Mr. Yao, our house just sold for 13 and a half million. I just can't believe it. A lot of rich people, that's true. But a lot of people, they actually sell the house to themselves. You know what I mean? Because the property developers, they are so rich. They don't need to sell every house. You got the Wimpy in this country, right? You know Wimpy? Taylor and Wimpy? Almost went bankrupt. But Wimpy and Taylor are the biggest house builders. They build beautiful, good houses. You know why they went bankrupt? Because they, they cannot afford to pay the loan. But in China, there are lots of loans. The money is there because the profit is high and the bank are queuing to give them money. So the bank, the local authority, the property developers, they, are, they form the so-called intertwined interest group. They get plenty of cash tons of cash. So that is why they can afford not to sell the house quickly. A lot of empty houses. This is called hoarding, creating shortage to get extra money and profit. A classical monopoly in, in terms, it, it's not like the uh, classical book we talk in the UK, it's actually encapsulated monopoly. <laughs> Thank you.
Any other questions from the audience? No? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. There, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Yao, uh, I got two questions, and uh, uh, it's all about the low-cost housing and the commercial housing contradiction in China. Uh, uh, from my research, I found uh, there are you know two pairs of contradictions. Uh, one one is Beijing's policy and the local government's policy. Uh, the problem is that uh, Beijing, uh, the central government of China, has got very good uh, housing policy. Uh, it uh, you know, ask the local government to provide uh, more land uh, for the low cost, uh, low cost housing. Uh, but actually, for the low governments, uh, their physical income is you know quite depend on real estate uh, industry, and uh, I I think they got no incentive uh, to provide land to the developers of uh, low cost housing companies. So um, I think that could be a kind of problem. Uh, and uh, what is your opinion to solve that uh, kind of uh, contradiction? And the second one is for the uh, something a bit political issue is that because uh, for low, co uh, low cost housing, I think uh, it is quite need a strict, more strict, even more strict uh, residential uh, registration policy, which is hukou. Because of course, uh, Beijing, uh, the, the big cities, uh, Beijing or Shanghai, their local government cannot provide uh, low, co uh, low cost housing to every immigrant just uh, arrived in Beijing or Shanghai. They have to, you know, uh, to check the, you know, the, the maybe the availability or to check uh, how how long years uh, this person uh, has been lived in our city is quite important. But however, the uh, economics uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable development in China is quite need uh, to ease the residential uh, uh, registration control, which is uh, also a national policy. Uh, I think that could be another kind of contradiction. And what is your opinion to you know, solve these two problems? Thank you. Okay, I think the, there is certainly an interest conflict between the national government and the regional government. The national government have a very clear policy I just mentioned. Actually, they categorize the population into three groups, and they have an appropriate policy just to say that the low cost and, and the so-called um, tend to satisfy the middle and the low income people but it's not implemented. This is the problem we already know and it's already discussed. How we actually do is that it need to have a much better in, uh, the so-called implementation of central government policy. Uh, somebody who have to say something, like the prime minister to say and have the authority, or the housing manager to say have the authority. So, the <laughs> But uh, this is the, the council controversy. So the, the government got to implement a much tougher policy. First of all, on the uh, land allocation, on the size of the housing. There are a lot of houses, they are built over the size, the legal limit. And the land is allocated for low cost housing, but they actually changed the nature of the land for cost, low cost housing to commercial housing. Because the low cost housing, the land is cheaper. And commercial housing, the land is more expensive. And the property developers, they, they, they change by bribing the people who are in charge of the land. And so this is why there are so many land cheap people, go right? So the corruption is in the process. Another thing is that even you build the low cost housing, who is going to live there? Actually, most of the time, it's the people who have already had many houses. They get the power to get the low-cost housing. This is another thing that the government have to be extremely careful and try to not to allow this to happen. As the Foucault system, it is a long-lasting issue. You know, the, the Chinese urbanization and the infrastructure, including the building of those houses, who do that? Who did those jobs? The rural workers who die on the motorway just to dig the tunnel, the rural workers. But when all the projects are done, when the houses are built, those rural workers 
are excluded. When you calculate the GDP of Shenzhen is surpassing 10,000 US dollars, who contribute those GDP? The people working in Foscom. But are those people enter into the equation when they calculate the average GDP? No. And when you enter the equation when the housing and also public services like hospital and school, are they enter the equation? No. So this is the concept of fairly open discrimination within the country. Sometimes some students complain to me, they say, we work in the UK, the UK university discriminates <coughs> us as a Chinese. I say no, because if you go to China, you will have more discrimination if you live in a different city or uh, from countryside to city. It is the society, you need to uh, uh, change this. But they, fortunately, there is one uh, spot of light in Chongqing. The new, the new mayor of Chongqing, Fan Qifan, uh, he, he already proposed a large po construction project, 30 million square meters. On average, the house, part, the house size is something like 50 to 60 square meters. They are going to house just half a million households. It is relatively small, but it is a very bold act for a local government. I just hope that all the local government can learn from Bo Xilai, can learn from Fan Qifang, to do something about the poor people, and taking away those barriers of the hukou system, making sure that the people who contribute to your city must also enjoy the public service. So this is the kind of uh, uh, dilemma at the, at the moment. Uh, people say it may not be affordable, but whether it is affordable, you have to play the game and make it fairer for, the, for every citizen. Okay, thank you very much. But I think, let me invite Professor Kwa up to the stage. Um, just to be fair, I mean, no, um, we need more questions probably. Uh, directed uh, to Professor Kwa as well. If you have now, we are open to both professors. Um, oh, so no matter what question, as as long as you think it is important, please raise the issue. So I saw the the hand there. Yeah, please, yeah. Yes. It, yeah. Oh, sorry. Over there. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I thought I gave the. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry, I'll then let's the start with. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks to Professor Hua and Professor Chen for the um, frank observation on the housing market in China. And the then great economist Adam Smith when said a society is only better off when the most vulnerable people in the society are better off. So I share your frustration and as a young professional, like most of the people sitting there are, I'm just wondering where, what lies the responsibility for us? What can we do to make the housing market a better place for the Chinese citizen? That's my first question. The second question is actually derived from uh, Mr. Chen's question about the comprehensiveness of the mathematical model and we derived to get the market about and how people about the people paying mortgage of the projection of their earning in the future time against the mortgage price, against the housing price, etc. I think the fundamental problem lies that Chinese people, when they buy a house, they use cash up front rather than have this idea of getting mortgage. The financial knowledge of, generally speaking, the general civilians among Chinese people are still not as comprehensive as our Western counterparts. So do you think there's any way we can improve the general understanding of, of financial uh, terms among the Chinese citizens to make that a, a better, basically a better world, a better place? Yeah. That's my two questions, basically. OK, um, actually, I'm getting hungry. So when you get two questions, I... <laughs> my brain is not working efficiently, so I forgot the second one. Uh, but I remember, do remember the first one, yeah. The, the first one is the work, work should we do. Uh, I think we should actually um, have some more research to compare uh, other countries' experience and how other countries' successful model. I can easily say there are lots of good models that China can follow. 
For example, like the Hong Kong model. I actually don't like the Hong Kong housing market policy at all. Ho Hong Kong house prices are extremely high. But, but China is catching up. Mainly China is catching up. Although Chinese GDP is still a fraction of the, Chinese, of the Hong Kong needs. But at least the Hong Kong government did something which I think is quite extraordinary. If the average household income per month is less than 20,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars, they are guaranteed the so-called low rent housing. Okay? In Singapore, it's the same. Even in Malaysia, where Danny come from, I went, just went to Malaysia two years ago. I was very impressed for an emerging economy like Malaysia. Everything is in place. They, they restrict the size of the house, and they uh, categorize the house into different categories, and they have a man that the poor people in their, their plant. In China, I have to say, in the last 15 years, there's very little attention paid to the low-income uh, people. Yeah? So this is, the, uh, this is the serious problem. So remind me the second question, anyway. Sure, just one sentence. What work do you make? Oh, basically, the, the model says, uh, I think Professor Chen is trying to say, why are we using the current income of, of people as sort of the exponential variable rather than have a trajectory of their future income? Because uh, the input of that will be used against the future mortgage payment. I, okay. I thought that was the question. And that was Chinese are significantly lower than the United Kingdom, right? And it would take many years for the Chinese average income to reach the UK level. But the Chinese house price is already higher than in the UK, already. So this already taking into account of the future income. And I don't know how long the future that the Chinese is able to catch up with the United Kingdom in terms of per capita income and GDP. Just to give you one example, I mean, I come from a very poor city called Nottingham. <laughs> Why is so poor? Because the three-bedroom house, Taylor's house, costs only 85,000 pounds. Okay? 85,000 pounds in, in China is, uh, is 850,000 renminbi. And in Shanghai, you can manage to buy just one toilet. <laughs> A broken toilet. <laughs> Um, Professor Kwa. Can I expand also on, on the question that was just yeah. asked, Professor Young? Because uh, I, I am curious along the same lines as the, the person who's just asked, because um, the observation that, that both he and I have made is that it, there is a popular impression that in China, but also in other parts of East Asia, when people make large purchases, things like houses or, or other things, there is much less reliance on going to take a loan to make these purchases. People save up and then mm -hmm. make the purchase of the house. Now, there are two ways to look at that. One is that Asian consumers or Chinese consumers are not yet as sophisticated in using financial markets to smooth their consumption. They realize that they have a lot of incomes coming in the future, but they don't take a loan against that. What they actually do is they save up before they buy. And in comparison with behavior in the United Kingdom, United States, and elsewhere, that seems to be behavior that's not as sophisticated. However, in this instance, it seems like this might be something that actually saves the Asian financial system, the Asian housing market, because there is obviously a much smaller probability that there will be a massive default on debt when there's in fact no debt being taken in Asian markets, unlike what we saw happen in the United States with the subprime mortgage loan debacle. So in this instance, it might be that what is not so sophisticated behavior turns out to be something that's actually prudent, that's actually been a good thing. And that at this point, we realize that US and UK financial acumen is actually not necessarily something that the rest of the world should seek to emulate. But the puzzle that's raised here is, given this, it would seem that that would already be a natural draw, a natural friction to make the Chinese housing markets not so bubbly. 
So the puzzle is why does it seem that house, Chinese house prices are still so high despite this difference in behavior? People are actually walking into apartments. Taxi drivers are walking into multi-million yuan apartments and handing over cash to make these purchases. How can that be happening? So I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, to pretend to be an expert on the dynamics of the housing market in the same way, but I, I want to just simply put forward observations that seem at odds with this view that what's happening here is purely exploitative, monopolistic manipulation of a housing bubble. I want to suggest that maybe there's some other things going on as well. Yes, now I gave the, yeah, to the lady, to, yes. In the middle, yes, please. Thanks a lot for that. Cheers. Hello, I have two questions, one for Professor Yao and another for Professor Kwa. Uh, first, uh, uh, for the, press, uh, the question for the Professor Yao, uh, thank you for I your explaining from the uh, aspect of the policy, uh, housing policy, and you explain why the uh, price, uh, uh, house price in China are so high. Or, uh, but I have the questions, compared, compared to the house, the house price uh, in Western countries, uh, our you know our commercial um, the commercial price house price uh, is very higher than the uh, price in Western. Also, it's also very higher than the uh, price in Western country. And uh, um, according to some economic series, uh, uh, the price of a property, the price of a set. Uh, must be linked with the value of the uh, curious, uh, curious, the money, the value of the money. How to how to explain the the higher uh, um, commercial price, house price in China? How how could do how do you explain this this question? And another one for Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Professor Kwa, uh, you you uh, in the first at the beginning you told us the uh, global imbalance global imbalance. Um, how do you think of the China tra trade Chinese trade? Uh, you know you can all of the maybe not all of the some many things pro, many product made in China, and uh, do you think uh, the Chinese trade is good for? Uh, Global imbalance, global trade imbalance, or uh, balance, global balance, or not? Thank you. So <laughs> that forgot the question. Are you? <laughs> so, Sorry, so I, I, so. Just, I just mentioned almost for uh, anyway. Um, look, your first question point to me, so I answer. Why the price is so high? I think uh, I actually example. The housing price is the stock market in China. You remember in 2007, the, house, the, the Shanghai Stock Exchange went up to 6,140 points. And when it comes down to the bottom, it's only 1,600 points. So why you explain this? The, stock, the, stack, the technology bubble in the UK, the tech market, uh, index I can understand, the NASDAQ I can understand because it is so-called concept stock. Now actually the Chinese people are, are buying the house as a concept house. Yeah, the, the house is just a concept. They consider this house all cement and metal. You know nowadays what, what do they do the metal because the house price is so expensive, the metal is so expensive. So they, they actually pull the metal thinner. There's a factory special just to pull the metal thinner, the, 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 uh, the steel uh, you know, stick. And I think the Chinese can actually claim another Nobel Prize by uh, how they actually pull those uh, you know, steel, uh, steel sticks longer without jeopardizing the quality. And they put the cement together and they consider this as gold white gold, because the house is white color, okay? How can you justify a house of 15 million? Just the condition I actually described, right? It is certainly beyond recognition. 
and they are look, they say China have little land, but it's not true. They are a lot of waste of land. And if you fully utilize those waste, China actually have lots of space, certainly much more than Hong Kong and Singapore. But how Hong Kong and Singapore manage it? This China have to learn a lesson from that. So I think that they, it is just a, a bubble people's irrational behavior. But I want to emphasize irrationality, irrational behavior cannot be 100% blamed on the government. The government have an important duty not to, uh, you know, to escalate the bubble. But it's not everything of the government. The Chinese people also have a duty. The ordinary Chinese people have a duty. You are not forced to buy the house. You buy the house voluntarily. And the people in Shanto, they join the VIP club. Nobody forced them. OK? So I think the, chi the Chinese market economy, because the reform is so fast, 30 years, so the Chinese people actually haven't gone through the rough time, boom and bust rough time. They haven't actually hurt them badly. Because the economy is growing at two digit level. And they always see, you know, uh, including all the audience and including our expert, Danny, they were saying, we we'll forecast the future. China will have a bright future. The income in China will be 100 times bigger than the United States. It is possible, but the likelihood and the distance have to travel by light. Well, actually, China created the Chang'e number two, you know? Yeah. The speed of Chang'e Chang number two is now 112 hours from the Earth to the moon. But last time, three years ago, it's, t it's taking 157 hours. So actually, the speed is getting higher. I think the price is rocketing higher. This is the mentality, the mentality of greed, envy, and speculation. This is the economic psychology that cannot be learned from the traditional textbook. And this is something challenge, something unique. That as young scholar, including uh, Bo Hong say I'm a little bit old now. No. Uh, so old and young, we work together to find out what's the problem. And we create a, a more rational uh, proposal to help the market. That's my intention, actually. <coughs> um, OK, thank you for your question. The, if I can paraphrase it, your question is, given what we see of Chinese trade, what is it doing for the pattern of global imbalances and what's it doing for the global economy? Is it a good thing? The first quick answer is the uh, standard economist's answer. And that is that, you know, in the midst of all our discussion of these trillions of dollars destroyed in the global financial crisis, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of global imbalances, we must not forget that international trade is a good thing. It is what's given us in the West cheap iPhones, affordable iPhones, it's given us affordable air conditioning, it's made all our lives more bearable. And a lot of that at source is, has come from the manufacturing facilities in China and Shenzhen and elsewhere. So all of that is a good thing. Um, the pre, in my own presentation, I, I, I spoke about how Chinese trade should be properly put in a context relative to global imbalances. And that was mostly to counter a view that I think sometimes we hear a little bit too often, a little bit too confidently, that the pattern of global imbalances that we see in the world today is the fault of China. My own view is that it is everyone's fault. It is the fault of the United States, the fault of the United Kingdom, and it's the fault of all the Asian overly exporting countries. And what we do need to do is to bring the global economy back to balance. The different ways in which we can think about doing that, one way would be to allow the wages in China to rise. As Professor Yao has emphasized, right now, the average Chinese person earns only one fifteenth what the average American does. China has a long way to go before it reaches the kind of prosperity levels that we see in the US or in the West generally. Even though China is now the world's number two economy in terms of size, it is still a very poor economy. It's still a developing economy. And China needs all the help it can get, whether it comes from being able to export more to the rest of the world, 
or in having greater confidence in its international policies. So I, what my, what the way I would answer your question is yes, this is you know yes the way Chinese trade has emerged has been good for China, it's been good for the world, and we need to think about restoring the global economy to balance. But it is not something that should be placed only at the doorstep of China. It's something that all of the world has to do. Thank you, Professor Kua. Um, before we are running out of time, um, let me put forward my question, which is very important. Um, you know, I was very scared every time when I heard something about Chinese house market. And today I'm even more concerned about it. So my question is, you know, Chinese houses are used as financial assets rather than the real assets. So there are so much, so many, you know, a lot of bubbles. My question to both professors are, when do you think the bubbles will, will burst? <laughs> so first of all, can I have the opinion from Professor Yao and then Professor Kwa, please? <laughs> so when the bubble, what? what? Um. Before I answer the questions, I try to find an excuse to defend my answer first. In uh, 2006, at the end of 2006, when the Shanghai Stock Exchange reached something like 3,300, uh, and I gave a lecture in <coughs> Tsinghua University, I say, look, uh, the, house, the, the stock market is a bubble, so don't invest. If you want to invest, you have to build a house fast. And they say, investment in stock market and building house fast works in the logic, Professor Yao. I say, because you have to build more houses so that when the stock market collapse, you have more love to kill and jump. <laughs> I think the government is doing just the right thing to cool down the market. If the government didn't do anything now, the bubble will burst and it will burst fantastically. And many people would be broad. They don't need to jump to, the, they don't need to queue to the top. They actually blow inside the house. They may, 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 there are lots of people who commit suicide. Uh, but luckily, I actually endorsed the state council to actually cool down the market. But the problem of the policy so far is not yet fully called to the issue. The call to the issue takes a long time. <coughs> So come back to your answer. If you say the bubble is going to burst or not, the answer is definitely yes. When? Two years. <laughs> um, when I say two years. From now. Two six, years from now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two, year, two years from last December. Two years from last December. Yeah. The last December, I was. I was interviewed by the Guangzhou uh, Daily, and the, the, actually you can go to the website and search my name, there's still a video there. Um, I predict the house market would collapse in two years. But I could, be, I could be wrong, because since I say the house bubble would collapse in two years, and between last December to now, mm -hmm. there are at least five fairly strong government policy to stop the bubble. And when I did the prediction, I didn't predict that the government is going to, to create so many new policies to stop the bubble developing. So I would have to adjust my prediction a little bit. I think from now is two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's very scary, to be honest, yeah. OK, let's hear from Professor Kwa. OK, the, when, when I was a graduate student, uh, Stan Fisher, you know, was a teacher of mine. Very and, famous economist. And he, and he told me that whenever economists get asked the, the following question, is the stock market going to go up or is it going to go down? Is the housing market going to go up or is it going to go down? He told me that you should always answer yes, <laughs> but not right away. <laughs> <laughs> the in the midst of trying to answer questions about whether there will be a crash, a burst of the stock of the housing bubble, we mustn't forget that prices exist out in the world for a purpose. 
They're meant to guide economic decisions. When prices rise, that is a signal that you should provide more housing because in the impending future, we're going to see hundreds of millions of people with the reform of the hukou system move further into the urban areas, and there will be a need to build a housing stock that's able to cater for the transformed Chinese economy in the future. So I, my own view is that it's a very delicate question whether the price movements that we've seen in the Chinese housing market now is obviously a bubble. Obvious, I think it's clear that some of it is probably not justified by fundamentals. But how much of it and how quickly that should adjust, I think that is an extremely delicate question. I think that there are certain things that can be done right away that would prevent a sudden market crash. The kind of very simple, small taxation on rapid turnover in property. Uh, very, very simple, you know, capital gains taxation that at the margin don't seem to do very much, but actually do the right things in terms of stabilizing the housing market. It seems to me, as Professor Yao has observed, that the Chinese government is making all the moves in the right direction. And my own hunch is that we can gradually cool the housing market to siphon off the bubbly aspects of it. And that if things are done right, we won't see a dramatic crash. So the question whether we will see a, the bubble pop has to be answered both yes or and no. no. In that we will not see as rapid an appreciation where house prices continue to run away from fundamentals like income. But whether there's a sudden crash in that, that hinges very much on astute government policy. There, I think, you know, someone asked earlier, what can we do to help? We should think about helping not just on the front of going out to Sichuan, building, uh, building structures in Sichuan, but also providing a voice that the government can feel that it draws on in what appropriate policy is, even in the urban areas. Thank you very much. I think we are all very happy about this. <laughs> At least we have some hope. Um, shall I? Yeah. Shall I continue or shall I close the session? Yeah. So I think you are, you are burnt. So yeah, let me, let me give this, um, yes, gentlemen, yes. One more chance, please. The last question. Um, first of all, thank you for organizing this event. I'm here kind of by coincidence. Uh, a friend brought me here and it's really uh, exciting to have all these people here discussing such important topics about development and sustainability and reform and change. I've been living in China for my last two years and um, uh, I lived in Beijing and I could see all these prices going up and all these uh, changes happening very rapidly. And I think <clears throat> one of the great, I mean the, the basic topic of conversation here is, is the idea of progress, the idea of change, the idea of how can we establish a more harmonious society in China and a more harmonious global world. And I think my experience in China taught me one thing, uh, I mean many things, but one thing that I would like to share and I would like to hear the opinion of the professors. And that is to have a more holistic view of the situations that are happening around us, the problems that are happening around us. And I think many times we tend to focus a lot of our energies and efforts into finding technical solutions to social problems, to financial problems. But we tend to forget that at the foundation of all of this is the individual, is the human being. So I'm just, I want to hear what the opinion is of the professors on this concept. Can it be possible to have economic development, social development, without having individual development, without having the individuals in China, around the world, in every country of the world, develop? And maybe I would like to hear what the idea of development is, according to the professor, the individual development. What is individual development? Um, that's it. Okay, I actually, your question is related to my previous answer quite a lot, because I think the, the kinds of social economic problem China today have, uh, partly due to the kinds of, uh, the time is going very fast, the Chinese is going too fast, that the government does not have sufficient time to realize the kinds of scale of social problems and use effective policy to contain and resolve those problems. 
And I think this is every country, including the crisis in the United States and the United Kingdom, the kinds of structural imbalances that they actually failed to address to create the, the crisis. Because uh, before the crisis, uh, the bank are encouraged, encouraging people to borrow, borrow, and borrow. Now we, ha we have to pay and pay and pay. Uh, so I'm not saying that this problem is unique for the Chinese. Actually, it's unique for human beings. Human beings tend to be, uh, have some sort of short-term uh, myopic behavior or the irrational behavior. So the people, including, now you come back to the relevant issue of whether it is stock market or whether it's a housing market, you always buy at the height. So when you people say, oh, we, because, the, because you are very short term, you only see uh, the, the very catching news item on the internet, say housing price in China, in Beijing, increased by 4,000 RMB per square meter. So why not buy again and then get the profit? And everybody have the kinds of feeling, you know? Then you, you, you actually deplete all your saving. You deplete not only just your saving, but your parents and grandparents' saving. Uh, if you can still remember by where's the Ken uh, Lao. Why people have cars to buy house? Because they save for many, many years. They borrow from friends. They borrow from their mother and fathers. They borrow from their grandparents, yeah? And they buy the house in order to live in the city. The young generation, the, I assume the poor graduate, the poor Chinese graduate, whether you got a master or PhD or a, a undergraduate, you try to work in Shanghai and Beijing, if, you are, if your parents are not living in the same city, it is a tremendous challenge. So we have to change our behavior the behavior of the government, the behavior of individual. But the problem is that once everybody tries to follow the height, you don't know. And unfortunately, it got to go through the painful experience of sudden crash or some sort of very much hurt like the stock market. Then you learn, you burn the fingers. And then you know, OK, I remember now. House price actually can go up, but also go down. But at the moment, the Chinese, including the audience, if you vote, I, I believe there are more than 50% of people who believe the Chinese housing market would not crash. It was still going up and up and it will never go down. And it is true. But what I can tell you is that anything, if you go up, it will go down. Professor Kwai? <clears throat> Okay, the, this is a question about individual development in the, you know, in the, an environment where economic growth, economic development is supposed to occur. I think that most observers, when we look at the economic history of China over the last 30 years, two overriding concerns, headlong economic growth on the order of double-digit rates and dramatic poverty reduction to the order of 627 million people brought out of extreme poverty in the last 25 years. As Professor Yao has pointed out, this has occurred hand in hand with a rise in inequality from Gini coefficient of 0.16 to now in excess of 50%, probably. So what is the tension? Where is, you know, how does this situation resolve? Has the Chinese model or models similar to it that other parts of the developing world have, uh, have embarked on, do they embark on this to a point where they've enriched just a few generating extreme inequality and left many others behind. Okay. How do I interpret this? I think one interpretation of this is that when we're talking about the kind of extreme poverty that we saw in 1981 or 1978 in China and in other parts of the world, we're talking about extreme poverty of a kind that most of us have never had direct contact with and most of us have great difficulty imagining. We're talking about people who live in, as Jeff Sachs, the economist at Columbia puts it, we're talking about people whose most valuable asset is the family animal that you let into the first floor of your house every evening because you don't want that family pig or family cow to run away. We're talking about people who have to dig holes in the ground for toilets. We're not talking about flush toilets, refrigerators, coffee machines, air conditioners. We're talking about extreme poverty. And anything that human society can do to alleviate their misery is a step in the right direction, I would argue, even if it comes at the expense of 
inequality. Notice that this statement does not really have anything to do with political systems. India is a democracy. The practice of democracy in India puts the practice of democracy in the US and UK to shame. It is a well-functioning democracy where elections work the right way. There's no problem with hanging chats in Florida and then the wrong person becomes president. None of that happens in India. But despite all of the glorious performance of the political system that's the democracy in India, it has failed to deliver. It has failed to deliver, and poverty in India remains higher now than it was 30 years ago. So I think we have to put these things in balance. As economic growth proceeds throughout not just China, but everywhere in the emerging world, education will become ever more important. People are happiest and most fulfilled not because they are the richest people in the world, but once they've gotten past the stage of extreme poverty, people feel that they have something that they can contribute to society. People feel that they can control their own environment against calamities, against corruption, against evil politicians. And people feel that they can manage the things around them to improve the lot of society overall. And that level of individual development is, I think, something that we will be expecting to see happen in China, but throughout the rest of Asia and the emerging economies. And I think we're on our way to doing that. Thank you. Okay, I think we, really, we are really, you know, we have to close this session. Let me take the last chance to thank Professor Kwa and Professor Yao for their beautiful, wonderful speeches and insightful answers to our questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh yes, um, somebody is coming to say something. About